Let's bounce up to the next moment in the Mercury program. We have a new rocket that the NASA Space Program is going to use because the first two Mercury rockets were redstones that were blasting the gentlemen up for short duration missions. In fact, the shortest missions of about 15 minutes. The rest of these missions, we needed a larger rocket because we're now going to orbit the astronaut in the Mercury capsule. So we need a larger craft for that. And the next rocket used in the U.S. manned space program is the Atlas rocket. So you want to jot that down, Atlas. There's quite a bit of excitement for this third mission since it is focused on orbiting the planet, the first U.S. astronaut to do so. So what you want to jot down is Glenn, and that he is the first U.S. American to orbit Earth. The three is just because I'm commonly asked how many laps around the Earth he made, and he did three. The first human to orbit the Earth, you'll recall, was Yuri Gagarin, 12th of April, 1961. The capsule was called Friendship 7. And uh, <clears throat> so back in my days when I was on social media, I, of course, followed Space Camp. And one year they put out this announcement, Happy Birthday, John Glenn, the first man to orbit Earth. Glenn would have been 96 years old today. This was my uh, profile pic at the time. Did I choose to write a comment? Of course, it's my job as an aerospace educator. First, asterisk, U.S. Astronaut, astronaut to orbit the Earth, as Yuri Gagarin was the first man to orbit Earth. Yeah, that's, that's how I am. It's my reputation with Space Camp. Here's Glenn in the simulator, training, practicing for this uh, very famous flight in NASA's history. Here's John Glenn, and he named his capsule Friendship 7. The artist who, from Friendship 7 on, put the artistry, the symbol and logo on the Mercury capsule is Cece Bibby. And oftentimes, she's the one that came up with the logo design. This right here is how it appeared after she had painted it, and this is how it appeared on the capsule after re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. So it's not much left, but I think it's quite impressive that some of that paint is left from traveling through the Earth's atmosphere. Glenn clambering, climbing in. The blast-off of his mission an image from when he was in space orbiting the planet. And once you orbit the planet, your photographs become colorized. I'm just kidding. Here is the capsule being captured by the marine helicopter. The green you see in the water is a dye that would be placed into the ocean for the helicopter pilot to be able to more easily see the capsule. It's a strategy that definitely wouldn't be used uh, nowadays for uh, spaceship recovery. Glenn orbits Earth three times safely. Picked up in capsule by destroyer. President will greet him in Florida. Cover of National Geographic. Uh, Glenn described his re-entry as just being surrounded by this big fiery ball. Here he is getting accommodation from President Kennedy. And his famous Mercury 7 spaceflight suit is on display in the Air and Space Museum in D.C. Also on display in the D.C. Air and Space Museum is the actual capsule. And the last time I went to the Air and Space Museum, the capsule was not too far from the entryway of the facility, and it always amuses me how many people are so excited to get into the Air and Space Museum, and they walk in, and there's so much to see that oftentimes they walk right by this because it is so close to the entry, and their eyes are looking farther into the museum. It's, of course, encased in protective acrylic. We tried to get a glimpse here to show you just how cramped it is in these capsules.
and I'll display some of the souvenirs now uh, from Glenn's mission. Nice and out of focus, one of my shots. But right here I was trying to take a picture of the applesauce that was provided as a snack for his journey. And the delivery system, you're in a weightless environment, you're not going to be able to spoon this to your mouth. And so it was delivered like a toothpaste uh, method from a tube. Very appetizing. In fact, here's a look at these snacks from the Mercury era. One of the things I realized quickly was crackers. Not a wonderful thing to have aboard a weightless flight as the crumbs would float into the capsule and there's potential they could get into the very precious electronics. One of the things we'll look at over this course is the evolution of space food. It has certainly come a long way from the Mercury days. The fourth flight is uh, to make sure that the Grissom flight, the Shepard flight wasn't a fluke, the Glenn flight wasn't a fluke. Now that's not how it was written as their mission protocols, but to show that, you know, this is a sustainable, viable space program. For Mercury's next and the fourth mission, we go to astronaut Scott Carpenter. And his capsule was called Aurora, and of course Aurora 7. Here is Cece showing off the great work that she has finished. Astronaut Carpenter describes a story of where a friend of his owned a paint company, and he wanted to test his paint products versus competitor products. And so they did the paint in three different uh, companies' base paints. And the mission was so long ago that Carpenter says that he can't remember which was his buddy's paint and competitor paints. So this is the Aurora after reentry. And the let's early look morning at launch Bush. of the Atlas D rocket was near perfect. However, trouble soon arrived as Aurora 7 slipped into orbit. As was experienced by John Glenn in the Friendship 7 capsule, the spacecraft's pitch horizon scanner, an important navigational device for properly aligning the spacecraft's orientation I to love the that planet, thing. I don't know had why. malfunctioned. Upon discovery of the malfunctioning scanner, Steps are taken to manually correct the flight path. However, the adjustments only address a few of the problems that will plague the mission. During the first dark side pass, Carpenter maneuvers his craft to observe ground flare experiments in Australia. By too eagerly pulsing the maneuvering jets to rotate the capsule from side to side, the limited hydrogen peroxide fuel supply is depleted faster than ground controllers anticipate. Fuel levels are lower than expected. I remain in automatic. Uh, I can, uh, I can stop this excessive fuel consumption. With the aggressive rotations comes an excessive heat buildup inside the capsule. Carpenter reports that sweat is interfering with his vision and making course adjustments much more difficult. NASA flight doctors note a spike in Carpenter's body temperature. Which may explain the slowed speech pattern in various reports the astronaut had made to ground control. Engineers meet to plan an abort. However, a discussion with ground technicians and flight controllers resolve to continue the mission. Soon, Planned observations of weightless liquid and orbital targeting balloons, photography of terrestrial features, and other meteorological phenomena are carried out. All the while, Not a beach ball. ground control stations around the globe maintain a watchful eye on the slowly depleting fuel supply. Unknown to Carpenter or anyone on the ground, another malfunction awaits. A timing mechanism for the retro rockets attached over the ablative heat shield 
and key to slowing the capsule for re-entry is not working properly. As the time for the rockets to fire automatically comes and goes, Carpenter must manually flip the trigger switch within a second. Two seconds later, the light of the three rockets illuminate the night. Although three seconds may not appear critical, when traveling over 17,500 miles an hour, or literally five miles per second, three seconds equates to 15 miles back on the ground. To survive his descent back into the thick atmosphere of Earth, Carpenter would need to gingerly coax what little fuel remained and make minor re-entry angle adjustments to control his falling capsule by manually steering the capsule and keeping the horizon in view through his one and only window. G-forces last longer than originally expected on the descent, but they are welcome as it means aerodynamic pressure is being exerted against the capsule and helping to keep an even trajectory on the way down. At 120,000 feet, Carpenter exhausts the very last of his fuel controlling the plummeting capsule. If he failed to do so, the capsule might have toppled completely 180 degrees and face topside down. Such an occurrence would point the drogue parachute in the wrong direction and snap the capsule back around so violently that the chute could be destroyed or severely injure Carpenter. Oscillations become worse and the capsule begins to sway through a 270 degree arc, almost a full circle. Carpenter has no choice but to manually deploy the drogue chute early at 26,000 feet, 5,000 feet higher than anticipated to stabilize the craft. He holds his breath as the six-foot drogue comes out in good shape and the descent comes back into control. Soon, the altimeter shows 10,000 feet. Carpenter manually deploys the chute and slows the craft before splashdown. Back on the ground, Gus Grissom, the second American in space, and now Capsule Communicator, or CAPCOM at Cape Canaveral Control Center, advises Carpenter he had indeed overshot his target area and that recovery teams were on their way. Approximately 45 minutes after his splashdown, 1,000 miles southeast of the Cape, planes from the USS Intrepid spot his location. Two rescue swimmers soon leap from orbiting helicopters to ensure Carpenter is safe, and then proceed to secure a flotation collar to the bobbing capsule. A few hours later, the second American astronaut to orbit the Earth arrives aboard Intrepid, and then to Grand Turk Island for debriefing. Carpenter is later awarded the NASA Distinguished Service Medal by Administrator James Webb during a ceremony held at Cape Canaveral on May 27, 1962 on behalf of a grateful nation. His successful mission to carry out important tests and experiments will ultimately show the Mercury spacecraft system can be improved and become a stable and safe capsule for many years to come. So the Carpenter Aurora mission was the first incredibly harrowing mission for NASA where first time they really feared that they may not be able to bring the astronauts safely home. Within NASA they have what's known as VOX, the voice operated exchange, or voice operated switch. The VOX are these devices that could be put into the homes of family members of NASA astronauts and they would be able to listen to the communication from NASA so the family were definitely aware of the harrowing situation that astronaut Carpenter was facing and definitely had the right stuff to land that capsule. Here's his wife showing strains uh, during the hour after Aurora 7's re-entry when there's no radio contact and her husband is feared lost.
but her mood changes to unrestrained joy when she and her son learn that a plane had spotted a life raft with a gentleman by the name of Carpenter in it. So they were listening to the Vox and sat there for the 45 minute of silent waiting to see um, the ultimate fate of their loved one. This is the life raft that they put around to help keep it afloat and stable for recovery. And there is that joy of the family of Scott Carpenter returning safely to Earth. There he is calling home. And I'm not sure, but I think this might be a reference from Space Chimps to the Aurora 7 mission of you're coming in too hot. You've got to reduce your angle for entry by 33 degrees. We have our first active communication satellite, Telstar. Do we think U.S. or U.S.S.R.? As always, let's see. From a ground station nestled in the mountains at Andover, Maine, a signal is sent to a speeding satellite, an historic feat that could reshape man's future. That satellite, of course, is the Telstar. 170 pounds of complex electronic equipment that receives signals beamed from Earth, magnifies them 10 billion times, and rebroadcasts them back to Earth. Pictures, telephone calls, telegraph messages, and computer data all can be handled by the orbiting device. The Telstar receives its power from batteries that are recharged by the sapphire-coated solar cells, which in turn are activated by rays from the sun as it hurtles through space at a low point of 600 miles to a high of 3,500 miles. The Telstar is sent aloft from Cape Canaveral atop a Thor Delta rocket in a joint industry government effort. The Space Administration team handles the launching for AT&T, and it's a $50 million phone call for the telephone company. call for the orbiting of 20 to 25 satellites like the Telstar. Thus, when one passes out of range of ground stations, another will be coming into position. Presently, along with the ground station in Maine, there is a receiver and transmitter in Great Britain at Cornwall, and in France, on the coast of Brittany. Even as Telstar is launched, the French rush to complete their installation to receive a signal that night. Now the rocket climbs far into the atmosphere, and the Telstar is about to separate and orbit the Earth each two and a half hours. Starting with the sixth orbit and through the ninth, the Telstar is in range of both the US and European stations, and pictures are received clearly in France, with somewhat lesser success in Britain on this first test. The signals are beamed from this 18-story dome that houses the super-sensitive horn weighing nearly 400 tons. An antenna so delicately tuned that it picks up a mere whisper of a signal from the satellite and amplifies it again billions of times for rebroadcast over cables or the air. Now comes the historic moment, a moment compared in significance with the first message sent over the telegraph. This is the first picture transmitted to outer space and received back again on Earth. Scenes of the dome at Andover are flashed across the sea, and man marks another milestone in this age of scientific miracles. So proudly it waves. What does the future hold? Well, scientists visualize a belt of tell stars encircling the globe in such a manner that transmission will be continuous around the world. Both sides of the Earth can be in immediate photographic contact, communication that could bring better understanding among men. Oh, if the Telstar creators could see us today and how dependent we are on the system of satellite active communications that we have, I think they would also be quite overwhelmed and perhaps underwhelmed at the same time of how maybe it hasn't brought us together closer as humans. But nonetheless, great victory for the U.S. here with the first active ComSat.